synthesis. So we're gonna get into the details of RNA, DNA, the ribosome, what happens, and so forth. So here's what you could do. You can describe protein synthesis as we're describing it in chapter three, part three. But then you can go back and talk about the organelles that are involved. So start in the nucleus, go to the rough ER ribosome, go to the Golgi, and you know, talk about the microtubules and the vesicle and bulk transport through exocytosis. You can describe all of that, and that will help you to tie together multiple concepts that we've seen in this class so that you're really making your studying a lot more effective in doing that. Okay, so you don't know yet um, about protein synthesis, well you might, but, um, but after today's class, you'll understand what we're talking about. And I will re be reviewing some of those um, organelles for you. And there's a diagram that shows you, I think it's around where the lysosomes are. The lysosomes. <coughs> There's a diagram that shows you the two things that can happen from the rough ER. So the rough ER can make proteins that are to be secreted out by the cell, and then you can also make proteins which are enzymes that are found in the lysosome, and the lysosome stays inside the cell. So that diagram you can use to describe protein synthesis if you wanted, and talk about the different organelles that are involved in that. I think that those are three major, major like process kind of ideas that we have covered. Okay, let's see. So, where did we, where did we leave off? We left off right here. Right here. Next one, right? That's what I thought. Okay. All right. So we, in the last class, we talked about cell signaling. Cell signaling can happen in multiple ways. Cell signaling can happen um, by way of chemicals, like neurotransmitters. They can happen, it can happen by way of ion flow from cell to cell to cell. It can happen uh, in lots of different ways. Um, and we talked about endocrine signaling, which happens uh, where a chemical is released, goes through the bloodstream, and goes to a particular target cell that's far away. We talked about paracrine signaling, which is something that uh, happens with cells that are very close by each other. So there, are, I mean, there are different ways that this can happen. We talked about synaptic transmission, which happens by way of neurotransmitters, which we're going to talk more in great detail about in chapter seven. Um, but in general. The regulatory molecules, or these, these chemical signals that cells release to communicate with other cells, can be polar or they can be nonpolar. And we've talked about those words before. Polar molecules obviously can interact with water, but they can't interact with lipids. So it's going to be hard for them to go through the phospholipid bilayer. Nonpolar molecules cannot interact with water, but they can interact with the lipid part of the phospholipid bilayer. Nonpolar molecules, they, bless you. Thank you. Are you just a one sneezer? No, no wish. Are like two sneezers. Yeah, I'll leave the room with that. Every. Yeah, that's like the common. Okay, so, so nonpolar regulatory molecules, they can pass through the plasma membrane of the cell. They bind to receptors in the nucleus and affect transcription. So this would include steroid hormones like testosterone or estrogen. These, if you remember from chapter two, are derived from cholesterol, which is a lipid. So for example, um, you know, men and women produce testosterone. Men produce more testosterone than women. Um, but testosterone's job is to stimulate production of actin, and myosin, which are found in the sarcomere. The more actin and myosin we have, the more we have a sarcomere, the stronger our contraction can be. So of course we can stimulate this through activities like weightlifting or you know, aerobic uh, training, different things like that. So what testosterone will do when it's released is 
It will pass directly through the plasma membrane. It will go to the nucleus of the cell. And in the nucleus, we have DNA, which has the gene for producing actin and myosin. And it will trigger that to happen so that we produce more actin and myosin um, to uh, ultimately produce more sarcomeres so we get a stronger muscle contraction. So testosterone being a lipid hormone can pass directly through the plasma membrane. It's sort of like if you're carrying, you know, some kind of a plan, some sort of a message of some sort. You need, um, for example, you're going to this company with a blueprint for a building that they have to, to make, they have to build. And you're a nonpolar molecule, you can get right through the security gate at the front entrance you don't have to stop there. You go right through the security gate. You go right up to the main door. You walk into, the, go to the elevator, go straight to the top, and hand the blueprint directly to the, the boss. So he has, there's no middleman. You can go directly and influence the production of that building. It's just like nonpolar regulatory molecules that can pass right through the plasma membrane, which is synonymous to that security gate and go right to the office door, which is just like the nuclear membrane, and affect production, in this case of um, actin and myosin. So do you have any questions about that so far? Okay, so then the opposite, uh, polar regulatory molecules, they can't get through the plasma membrane. They have to bind to a receptor, which is a lot slower. It's kind of like if you had a blueprint that you don't have security clearance. You gotta give the blueprint to the guy, the security guard at the front gate. Then he's gonna give that blueprint to the next guy, a courier or something inside the gate, who's then gonna maybe give it to somebody else and eventually it will get to the main box and then you'll get production of that building. Well, polar regulatory molecules, they bind to the cell surface receptors. So they bind to the surface of the plasma membrane and send something called a second messenger into the cytoplasm to cause something to happen. So the second messenger would be just like that security guard that you give the blueprints to. He's not, you're the primary person. You're the primary messenger, but he is the second messenger. And second messengers usually stimulate a series of events that will ultimately lead to what we want to happen. Um, for example, uh, cardiac muscle, um, when it contracts, there's a series of, of, I guess you could say it's like a cascade of events that occurs. When cardiac muscle uh, contracts, it, it requires uh, something called epinephrine or norepinephrine. It's also known as uh, noradrenaline. It's derived from adrenaline. You know what adrenaline does to your heart rate, right? Speeds it up, right? You get your adrenaline rush. You get uh, a harder, stronger, and faster contraction rate of the heart. Norepinephrine and epinephrine cannot get through the plasma membrane. They're going to bind to the surface of the cardiac muscle cell. And then inside in the plasma membrane, there's a second messenger, which again triggers a cascade of events to occur that ultimately will lead to muscle contraction. So, second messengers can be things like ions, like calcium, or other molecules such as cyclic AMP, also known as C-AMP, um, or G-proteins. Now, we're just gonna talk generically about the G-protein, okay? And later, we're gonna talk more specifically about it when we talk about the nervous system because we're gonna see where G-protein second messengers are required for certain neurotransmitters when they bind to certain cells and specifically how they work. So right now we're just looking at this very generally. G proteins are made up of three uh, protein uh, subunits. They are covalently bonded together. They are named for the Greek letters uh, alpha, beta, and gamma, or A, B, and C, essentially. Alpha, beta, and gamma. And so what will happen is, whenever we get a regulatory molecule that binds, some type of a chemical messenger binds to the receptor, it's gonna cause this G protein to disassociate. It's going to break apart, and depending upon how it breaks apart, 
it's going to cause different things to open. So, for example, um, may, it doesn't say here, um, it doesn't say here specifically, but beta gamma, in this case, might cause a, say, a potassium channel to open. If a potassium channel opens, which direction would potassium flow, into the cell or out? Where's potassium, because of the sodium potassium pump, where's potassium concentration the highest? Inside the cell, right? Sodium is highest outside. So which direction then would potassium diffuse if it were going? It's gonna go out because it's in high concentration in the cell, less outside. So it's gonna diffuse following its gradient out. Okay, now we haven't talked specifically about what this means. But obviously we're gonna be disrupting the membrane potential in one way or the other, right? And if this happens, it's gonna cause one thing to happen. Um, if we had, for example, the alpha occurring, uh, maybe this opened up a, a sodium channel and sodium maybe would flow which direction, in or out? Into the cell, exactly. And that will cause something else to happen. Um, again, in chapter seven, we're gonna get more specifically into this, but in general, potassium usually causes inhibition. So if this were cardiac muscle tissue, if we say open the potassium channel, we're gonna get a slower heart rate. If we open the sodium channel, in general, that causes them to be excited, you're gonna get a faster heart rate. So the idea is, is that the Neurotransmitter can't get through the membrane, has to bind to a receptor, which triggers this G protein second messenger to disassociate. And depending on how it disassociates, it's going to um, cause different effects. And again, I gave the example of a sodium and potassium channel opening. Um, but there are lots of other things that can happen. Once its job is finished, the G protein comes back together and waits for the next molecule to bind. So in general, that's how a G protein second messenger would work. And we'll get more specific about it as we go through. So do you have any questions about this? All right, so that concludes the first part of the chapter three notes in chapter six. Uh, chapter six, we're, we're basically done with now but we're gonna look at chapter three, um, part two next, which is a look at the cell cycle, which is basically the life cycle of the cell. When we get through this, then we'll go ahead and take a break and then we'll go into part three after that when we come back from the break. Unless you guys need a break right now. You need a break right now? It doesn't feel like we've been doing this for very long because you took the quiz, but I don't know, you might be tired. All right, well, the cell cycle uh, is very important and it's important that it works properly. Otherwise, if it doesn't, it can cause pathologies like cancer. So here's some of the things that we are going to be discussing here. You can uh, talk about the different stages of the cell cycle, what happens in each stage, We'll talk about oncogenes and P53 as an oncogene. Um, we'll talk about cyclins a little bit uh, and talk about necrosis versus apoptosis. We'll look at the events specifically of mitosis and we'll look at the events of meiosis. And I have a brief little assignment for you to help you study. And you guys can turn that in um, the next time we meet and you'll get basically 10 points that are bonus points, uh, five for each of these. So I will uh, explain that to you. And then we'll talk about, uh, we're gonna talk about mitosis and meiosis, some of the differences with the processes. You can actually scratch out epigenetic inheritance. We're not going, I'm not gonna ask you any questions about that. Uh, that's the last slide in this uh, PowerPoint presentation but um, I'm not gonna ask any questions about it. Okay, so most cells of the body uh, are in the first phase of the cell cycle known as interphase. Interphase is the non-dividing phase in the cell's life cycle. It's where it's going about its daily business. If it's 
you know, if it's a liver cell, it's detoxifying things, it's producing some of the steroid hormones. If it is a muscle cell, it's contracting and relaxing. Um, you know, if it's a heart muscle cell, it's pumping blood through the body. You know, it, it, it's just the, the phase in the cell cycle where the cell is just performing what it was designed to do. It's a kidney cell, it's reabsorbing nutrients and so forth. So this uh, diagram shows us the entire cell cycle. The green part uh, is the interphase uh, portion of the cell cycle, which again, we just described. The interphase portion of the cell cycle is going to be variable in terms of length. Some cells have a very busy life and they become old and worn out very quickly and they need to divide more quickly. So they have a fast turnover rate. For example, white blood cells, specifically fighting infection, they become tired and worn out and they need to divide. Um, they need to produce more. So the interface portion is going to be very easy. There are three sub portions to interface. There's the G1 phase, S, and G2. G1 specifically is where the cell, again, is performing its day-to-day -day activities. Pancreatic cell is producing insulin and glucagon. Um, then when it's time for a cell to begin to get ready to divide, it enters into S, which is also known as the synthesis phase. This is where we're going to replicate or make a complete copy of our DNA. All 46 of our chromosomes are going to make complete copies of themselves so that when we produce a new cell, we're going to have identical genetic components. So S is where DNA replication takes place. Then G2 is the final growth and activity phase before mitosis. So this is kind of like you're getting ready to go on a picnic and you're packing everything in that you can so you don't forget anything. In G2, you're going to be making more ribosomes, more organelles. You're going to be making more stuff that's necessary so that the new cell, when the cell divides, will have enough of everything that it needs. Just like going on a picnic, you need to make sure you have enough food for everybody so that no one goes hungry basically what G2 is. You're making more organelles, you're getting everything ready before mitosis. So then we enter into the mitosis phase, um, which we're going to be talking about specifically. Mitosis is actually pretty fast. The process of mitosis is specifically the process by which almost all of the body cells divide, with a few exceptions. First of all, blood cells. Red blood cells do not have a nucleus, so they don't have chromosomes, they can't go through the S phase, so they don't divide. Um, the other two types of cells that do not go through mitosis are sperm cells and egg cells. They have their own process, known as meiosis, which we're going to talk about later in this chapter. But all other cells in the body pretty much undergo mitosis, and that's their process by which they divide. Okay. So, once again, interphase, variable, we have G1, where the cell performs day-to-day -day functions. When it's time to divide, we go through S, which is where DNA replication takes place. We make replicas or complete copies of all 46 chromosomes. Then we enter into G2, which is where we make more ribosomes, more organelles, lysosomes, and so forth, to get ready to go into the division phase, which is known as mitosis. Mitosis is subdivided into a couple of different phases, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and then the cytoplasm splits in the process known as cytokinesis, and now we have two cells. So I always remember the order of these phases by remembering P, mat, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. We're gonna talk specifically about what happens in each phase. And the nice thing is, once you know what happens in each phase in mitosis, when we talk about it in meiosis, it's a lot of the same things. So it's not like you're learning brand new things for each process. Okay, so first of all, 
oncogenes. Our genes, when they are mutated, will lead to cancer. So one of the most common tumor suppressor genes is known as P53. P53 codes for a protein that checks the DNA to make sure that it's not faulty before the cell divides. Because what happens is if your DNA somehow mutates and it goes unchecked, then the cell divides and it divides and divides. And each time that cell, that new cell that divides, its DNA is now different than the, than the original cell. And what will happen is, is that when it divides, its DNA will become even more different than the original cell. And you get this, this new cell. And then that cell will mutate its DNA further. And so pretty soon, it doesn't, it's nothing like the original cell. That's why they do a biopsy. A lot of times if they wanna figure out if a tumor is, uh, um, if it's malignant or benign, they'll look to see how different the cells are in that mass from the original cells because it mutates. And that's why cancer cells can go unchecked. But P53 codes for, codes for a gene, or I should say is a gene that codes for a protein that checks, um, checks the DNA at different points. So there's actually a G1 checkpoint kind of like if you're playing a video game and you've finished, you go through and you make it to a checkpoint and then the game saves for you. It's okay, you're good, you made it. The G1 checkpoint, you have, you have um, the protein, and I think P53 actually codes for the protein that's the G1 checkpoint. Um, checks to make sure all the DNA is okay before it replicates. Then after replication takes place, there's a G2 checkpoint that this protein is gonna to check to make sure that the DNA is the same as the original cell. And if it's not the same, then what happens is it can either promote repair of the DNA or apoptosis, which is cell death. It will cause the cell to commit suicide and it will not be allowed to divide. Mutations in P53, that gene, that oncogene, are found in more than 50% of all cancers including breast cancer, testicular cancer, ovarian cancer, lung cancer, um, I think esophageal cancer. So tons and tons of cancers. If you ever looked up research about P53, they, they're doing research in P53 for almost any kind of cancer you can think of. Cyclins are another type of protein that promotes different phases in the cell cycle. If these are overactive, these genes, this can also cause cancers to occur because it can cause cell division to continue when it's not necessary. See, tumor cells don't know any boundaries. They grow on top of each other, and that's not normal. You know, and for example, the digestive tract, if you wear out an epithelial cell in the small intestine, then you're going to divide, that cell will divide, and a new one will come in its place but the cells have these negative charges that keep them away from each other and they're not gonna grow on top of each other. But if you have genes that are overactive, like these cyclins, um, the cells will start to grow on top of each other and they'll do so unchecked and that can cause uh, cancers. Any questions so far? Okay, cells can die in two different ways. Uh, the first way we talked about already, apoptosis. This is where the cells um, are programmed to die. So what usually happens is there's a signal that's sent to the cell and then you'll have a series of second messengers and you'll have a cascade of events that ultimately leads to the lysosomes within those cells to rupture and release the enzymes. When it ruptures and releases the enzymes inside the cell, then the cell will digest itself from the inside out. And that's how apoptosis really occurs. 
So apoptosis is known as programmed cell death. It involves activation of a class of enzymes called caspases. And there are many different types of caspases. There's BID, BAX, BAC, all, they have all three letter names. BCL2, there's tons of different um, ones that ultimately lead to the cell death. The other way that cells can die is through necrosis, and this is through pathological issues, such as if a person has um, a diminished blood flow to the heart muscle tissue, and you know the person has a heart attack, the, um, the cardiac muscle tissue is going to die. And generally, cardiac muscle tissue has a very low regeneration rate, so once you lose it, you lose it, and the cell can't pump as effective, or I should say the cells aren't gonna be as strong, the remaining cells to pump as much blood. That's why a person's heart weakens after a heart attack. Um, the, the, uh, the heart muscle tissue, because it loses that oxygen uh, delivery, because the blood vessel is occluded, is going to ultimately cause it to die. And that's where some of those white blood cells like the macrophages will come in and clean that up, those dead cells, so that they don't remain. Um, but that's the difference. There are two different ways that cells can die, through apoptosis or through necrosis. Yes? What could cause necrosis in your um, heart? Is what kind of conditions? If you, if you have a heart attack, if you lose blood flow to the heart and you don't have enough oxygen, the cardiac muscle cell, they can't, they can't make enough energy anaerobically to sustain themselves, so they so die. It's like the, it's almost like the inactivity, like, okay, so like heart attack is caused by like uh, arteries being clogged or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. So like that change in the pump cycle, whatever that causes the cells to necrote. The fact that the cells don't have enough oxygen okay. themselves, that's what kills them. Because cardiac muscle tissue has no choice but to continue to beat, right? It just beats and beats and beats. But the problem is, is that if you're making, if you're making the cells contract w without enough oxygen available, they're gonna start to produce lactic acid, just like your skeletal muscles do. That's why you get burning sensation if a person has a heart attack. It's the same idea and you get the pain from that because, it, or if the person has the angina. So but, like a pericarditis, right? An inflammation? Well, pericarditis is thing. completely different. Okay. Yeah, that's completely different. Now we're talking about diminished blood flow to the heart muscle tissue. That lack of oxygen will ultimately cause the cells to not be able to sustain their activity level, and then they die because of that. And when they die, they have to be cleaned up, and that's where the macrophages come in. So that's necrosis. Or if a person has a stroke and you get occlusion um, of blood vessel that goes to the brain, what happens is, is that when a stroke initially occurs, just the cells that are around the area, the blood vessel are gonna die. But if a person doesn't treat a stroke, uh, hours after the stroke occurs, you'll get what's known as a penumbra, which is like a halo effect where the cells, it starts to spread and like more nerve cells die off that are actually. You know, I've seen like uh, dermatological necrosis at the hospital mm -hmm. or like. Well, like okay, so like if you. The same rationale? Well, burns can, you know, cause necrotic tissue to occur. You know, it's dead cells that are on the surface, so they have to go in and try to remove that, you know, that those layers of the, the skin. Yeah, and See, I'm thinking of like, like a necrofasciitis where we're like, oh, we have to amputate a limb, but like I never have thought of it like as being in the heart. Sure, it can be in the heart, it can be in the skin. Any it can cell? Be any, any cell. N the nerves, the, the neurons in the brain. Yeah, same, same thing. Yeah. Okay, so any other questions? Well, I feel like maybe we needed to take a break because everybody has to seem to go to the bathroom now. Nobody's smoking in the bathroom. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was really funny. He came in and said that. All right, anyway, um, okay. So I wanna explain a little bit here about uh, the difference between chromatin and chromosomes. So 
in interphase, our DNA is in the form of what we call chromatin. Chromatin is more loose and diffuse. And actually, I think it was a couple years ago in the dining hall, Dr. Viart needed a little activity in there where you could extract your cells. You guys ever d extract DNA in high school or anything like that? You can take any cells that you have and you harvest them, you put them in the solution that's hypotonic. And when you do that, then the cells will rupture and the DNA comes out into this fluid. And if you look at it as it's suspended in the fluid, it looks like cotton. It's very light, very, you know, very diffuse. If you take it out of there, it looks like snot. <laughs> it actually clumps up. But in the water, in the, in the solution, it looks very light and fluffy. And that is actually the chromatin form. Chromatin is, again, it, DNA is highly ordered. It's coiled up pretty tightly. Uh, it's true. But in interphase, when the cell is producing proteins and things from its DNA, it needs to be in this loose form so that you can access the genes. But when the cell is getting ready to divide, just like if you were trying to water your plants with the garden hose, right? Think about that. Think of the garden hose as if it's unwound. It's sort of like in the chromatin form. But isn't it easier to move the garden hose if you're not lazy and you actually wrap it around your arm and you carry it to the next location instead of trying to like drag it with you and you knock out half your plants and all that? I, like I do that all the time because I'm lazy. But it's so much easier if you coil it up more tightly to move things. And so that's what happens when we go into this whole idea of, um, of uh, DNA, uh, or I should say cell division, DNA replication uh, and cell division, ultimately our chromatin is going to condense really tightly into chromosomes. So what happens is um, in the S phase, as I said, we make a complete copy of every single chromosome that we have. And that copy so if, say your first chromosome uh, copies itself, you have a two first chromosomes, right? You have two first chromosomes and they are gonna stick together by way of a sticky protein called a centromere. So this, on this side would be the, maybe the, the original chromosome. The other side here is gonna be the, the replicated uh, form of it. It's held together by a sticky protein known as a centromere. And these are called sisters. It doesn't matter if it's your father's DNA or your mother's. It's, they're called sister chromatids. So we have chromosome one, it's copy. Okay, so these are genetically identical. These are called sister chromatids. They're held together by a centromere. Both of these are genetically identical. Okay, so we have two different terms here. One I, I just described, sister chromatids. Sister chromatids are genetically the same, okay? So they're genetically the same. These are the chromosomes where you have the one original chromosome that's attached to its replica, its copy. So they're genetically the same. Those are sister chromatids. Homologous chromosomes are chromosomes which contain information about characteristics in the same location or loci, but the information is different because one is from the mom, the other is from the father. Okay, so here we have, say, here we have our, let's see, our father's and our mother's DNA. Okay, so. Let's say this is chromosome pair one. So these are our first chromosomes. So we have what are known as our homologous chromosomes here. Okay, because we're going to have say, genes about eye color, hair color, or something like that. Same location on that chromosome, but the genetic 
information is different because one gene you got from your father, one you got from your mom. So these little bands that I drew here are the gene or whatever. Okay, these are homologous chromosomes because these contain information about the same characteristics like eye color and the same location, but the genes are different because one comes from the father, one comes from the mother. Does that make sense? So those are homologous, homologs, we say. Okay, now during S phase, I'm losing my ink, it's protesting. I have to use a different color. During the S phase, we get replication of homologous chromosomes. Okay, so now, unfortunately, I wish these were the same color. I don't want to confuse you. So what we're going to do, father, father's chromosomes are going to replicate themselves. Okay, so now we have complete genetically identical copies held together at, with the centromere. The mother's chromosomes are going to make a replica of themselves. And again, we're going to have genetically identical copies. Okay, so this is dad's, this is mom's. And these are sister chromatids. Okay, does this make sense? Does anyone have any questions about this? Okay, so those are some terms. We'll use them again and again. Okay, so now what I'm going to do, I'm going to skip this because uh, I prefer to take a look at the pictures. I think the other previous slides are just narrative of what I'm going to tell you. Um, you can refer back to them, but I like to look at the, the pictures to describe. Again, what's happening in each one of these phases um, is something that once you learn the, the, the what the main events that happen in, in each phase. This also kind of repeats itself in meiosis as well, only there are some differences and we'll talk about. So mitosis, okay, our cell starts out in interphase, okay, we have our nuclear membrane visible and we have chromatin material at this point. Okay, but by G2, we now have more organelles, we have replication that's taken place. Um, so we have our sister chromatids there um, and so forth. Okay, now we enter into the first phase of mitosis, prophase. Prophase is where we start to see the nuclear membrane go away, disintegrates, and now the chromatin becomes highly condensed and you can really see the chromosomes at this point which again are sister chromatids. These are identical replicas of each chromosome you have held together by the centromere. There are a couple of structures um, known as uh, centrioles. Centrioles are interesting. Um, do you remember how when we looked at the video of the cell, the inner life of the cell, and I told you, I'm like, oh, there goes a microtubule, it's assembling and it's disassembling and all of that. Well, that is under control by these structures called centrioles. And the microtubules, we know, are part of the cytoskeleton and the microtubules act like train tracks on which vesicles can be carried along to the plasma membrane or to whatever destination, but <coughs> the microtubules are also going to play an important part in mitosis, in cell division. So the centrioles are going to start to migrate to opposite poles of the cell and the microtubule spindle is going to form in prophase. 
And this spindle, this microtubule spindle, will attach to the centromere, that sticky protein that's holding the sister chromatids together. It will attach to that, and um, then prophase will pretty much be finished. So again, prophase, nuclear membrane disintegrates, the chromatin becomes visible as the sister chromatids, they're highly condensed. Our centrioles migrate to opposite poles of the cell and produce this spindle, this microtubule spindle, which attaches to the centromere. Now we're ready to start moving our sister chromatids around. Okay, so I explained what the centrioles were. Okay, and then we enter into the second phase of mitosis, which is metaphase. Metaphase is the really one major thing happens uh, in metaphase, and that is, is the sister chromatids are arranged in the middle of the cell, known as the equator, just like the equator that goes around the Earth, right? It sort of divides it into an upper portion and a lower portion. The sister chromatids are going to line themselves up on this equator. And then in anaphase, one major thing happens, and that is, is that the microtubules start to shorten and they'll pull the sister chromatids to opposite sides of the cell. And then finally in telophase, the last phase, everything happens in reverse of prophase. Now we're gonna see our nuclear membrane reforming, our microtubule spindle is gonna go away, and our um, chromatids are gonna start becoming uh, Chrom chromatin again. They're going to start to become loose and diffuse again, like they did, uh, or how they were before. Being able to describe the events in mitosis is something that probably also will be a good thing for you to kind of study. It's you know, something that you might see on the test. Just some of the main things that happen in each phase. So once more, I'll go back and review this. Because again, like I said, we're gonna be reviewing this in, in uh, meiosis as well. Okay, so starting out interphase, we have chromatin, loose diffuse form of DNA visible, we have our nuclear membrane. Then we wanna enter into the cell division phase, so we start with prophase. Our nuclear membrane goes away, it disintegrates. Our chromatin becomes visible as chromosomes specifically sister chromatids that are held together by the centromere. Our centrioles migrate to opposite poles and our mitotic spindle forms and attaches to that centromere, that sticky protein. Then in metaphase, the mitotic spindle, that microtubule spindle is gonna line all the sister chromatids up on the equator. And in anaphase, the spindle shortens and pulls the sister chromatids to opposite poles of the cell. And then in telophase, the opposite happens. We start to get our uh, nuclear membrane reforming, the spindle goes away, uh, and the sister chromatids, or now their chromosomes are gonna become chromatin again. We're gonna get light and diffuse again. And then the cytoplasm splits and we have two new cells. So when we go through the S phase in interphase, okay, we start out with 46 chromosomes. What do we end up with? We have how many? 92, right? Because every chromosome is going to make a complete copy of itself. We end up with 92. So we have our sister chromatids. When they get pulled apart to opposite poles, now each cell is going to have exactly the same genetic information and will each have 46 chromosomes. Does that make sense? So you produce two daughter cells, we call them daughter cells, and each one is genetically the same. So that's why when you have one of your digestive system cells that divides itself, it's going to have the same genetic material, and you want that. All cells in your body have all the genetic material that all the other
other cells have. Not that each cell uses all that genetic material. They're going to use the portions that they need to use, but um, every cell has, has, has the same information. Okay, so there's a summary page, and I'm going to go back to this homework assignment. Um, the events of mitosis, we have one DNA replication in the S phase. We have one cell division that takes place. Two cells are produced, and they are genetically identical. Each of the two daughter cells contains 46 chromosomes, or 23 pairs. And they have, each cell has a nuclei that contains all the genetic material for your entire genome. Okay, so... There is a homework assignment, which I have here in red, and I'm just going to show you a little bit here. Let's see. Um, I forget again. How, is, how do I call it in the window? I asked this before. I go over here. You don't have to do that. Forget what I did. Stay down here. Um, should be a little plus sign at the top. Plus sign at the top. Yeah, let's see it then. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what browser are you using? I think I'm not sure. It might be Firefox. Maybe. Just right click. Mm, yeah. No. Wrong oh, one. I don't know how to use computers. I, I have a Mac, and I don't know. It just always confuses me when I try to do this. I don't know why, but it does. Come back. Nobody in here knows how. You go to the Internet Explorer button. Here? Open a new window again. I the same. I, I learned nothing the first time I asked this question. I have no idea. That's just PowerPoint that you're in now. Yeah. Yes. Maybe we can there you go. Yeah, the uh, where's the window? Right there. This? Oh, yeah. there it is. Ah, okay. Well I'm glad to know that apparently I'm not the only one. Oh, what? The resource can't be found. I don't think so. Because we can't do our homework, huh? That's no. too bad. I was excited for it. Oh, don't worry now. There we go. Okay, so this is what you should, you're going to see something like this whenever you, actually I think, I think the link I put on there takes you here to this page. Okay, so this is the cell cycle and mitosis tutorial. And the reason I'm making this bonus assignment due on Tuesday is because I've had people turn it in the last day of class, but what good is it if you don't do it before the test? <laughs> so we're going to um, have this due on Tuesday. This will be worth five points, and then the other tutorial will be worth five points. So what you'll do, you can read through DNA basics, the cell cycle, and mitosis, and then you'll go to test yourself. And when you go to test yourself, there are 11 questions there, and you can take it as many times as you need. At the very end, it'll say, congratulations completed the cell cycle and mitosis tutorial. Just print that last page out. That's all you have to do is print out the last page, put your name at the top, and that's what you'll turn in for me. Now, in the meiosis stuff that we're going to be talking about next, at the end of that, there's also a link, but it actually, I think it takes you to the same place. There's one for meiosis as well. So once you're here, Okay, once you're on this page, if you go up to the top, see where it says uh, cell biology, click on cell biology and it'll take you back here to this menu. And so here are all of the different tutorials. You completed the cell cycle and mitosis one, so you don't have to do that again, but click on the meiosis one and it has the same format. So you'll read through reproduction and um, meiosis one, meiosis two, and then test yourself 10 questions, same thing. At the end, it'll say, congratulations, you've completed the meiosis tutorial. Print that out, write your name at the top, and that will be worth five points. So 
both of them together are worth 10 points if you turn those in. And that's a bonus assignment. So again, you don't have to do it, but why wouldn't you do it? Because it's 10 points and it'll count towards your quiz grade. So like, uh, you know, when we drop the lowest quiz, if say you got 100% on the other quizzes, then that would actually bump up your quiz percentage grade more than what it's worth, which would be not too shabby because then if you don't do as well on tests and you lose some percentage points there, it can balance it out and it'll help. Okay, so that is um, <coughs> that one. All right, so lastly, we don't have too many more slides left. Um, we're going to talk about meiosis. So this is the process by which cells divide, specifically sperm cells and egg cells. So um, it, what we're looking at really is spermatogenesis here because in the process we're going to be describing, um, the, what we're going to produce are four cells with oogenesis. Oogenesis occurs, um, it, it finishes, I guess you could say, the meiotic division of the egg cell finishes right before ovulation. So interestingly, part of meiosis happens in eggs, um, but the, the final division doesn't happen until right before ovulation. Spermatogenesis, which again is basically what we're talking, and you're only going to produce one egg. Um, whereas with spermatogenesis, it's ongoing all the time, and you're always going to produce four cells, which is why men have, you know, millions of sperm cells uh, in general at any time. So meiosis, again, is the type of cell division that occurs in ovaries and testes to produce the egg cell and the sperm cell, and Unlike mitosis, we have two divisional sequences. DNA is only replicated once, but it divides twice. Why is this? Because ultimately, in an egg cell and a sperm cell, how many chromosomes do you want in each? How many, how many chromosomes does a person have in each cell? 46, right, or 23 pairs, but we want our sperm and our egg cells to have each only 23, right? Because when they come together, then that zygote will have 46. You'll have 23 from your mom and 23 from your dad. So you get your 23 pairs or 46 chromosomes. So that's why we divide twice. So we only have half as much in terms of the, the chromosome numbers. Okay, so, um, one thing that happens that gives us, I'm actually gonna skip those slides again, those are narrative of what I wanna explain. Um, what happens uh, that provides for great genetic diversity pretty much happens in the first meiotic division, specifically in, in the first prophase. So with meiosis, again, there are two divisional sequences. We still have prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. But the first divisional sequence we call prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase one. And then the second divisional sequence we call prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase two. So, so um, we have uh, happening in prophase one, oh, and I guess something else too. For the sake of simplicity, they only drew, they only drew out like uh, the sister chromatids of like two, two chromosomes. So like, we can say like the red one is dad's, the purple one is mom's. Um, and again, you can see that there are two. So maybe that's like the sister chromatids of chromosome one and the sister chromatids of chromosome two. It doesn't matter what you look at. But what we're seeing here in prophase one, in addition to the fact that the nuclear membrane starts to disintegrate, the centrioles migrate to opposite poles, and the mitotic spindle forms and attaches to the centromere, just like we saw in mitosis. Um, those are the main events. The other thing that we're seeing is that these chromatids are arranging themselves right by each other. They form, 
what are known as a tetrad. Tetra, of course, means four. And what you'll see is you'll see, for example, this is dad's, okay? And have our G here. And this is mom's. Okay, and they get very close to each other. They line up real close to each other so that they can actually swap genetic information. We call this crossing over, crossing over. So what will happen is ultimately when they come together and then they, they touch each other and they swap genetic information, now you're going to see that the genes, they aren't the same. So these really can't be called sister chromatids anymore. We simply just call them chromatids because they're not genetically identical anymore. See, so now mom's chromatid has some of dad's on there and dad's has some of mom on there. And that's how we get kids that resemble each parent but don't look exactly like them. Although sometimes it does look Gosh, that would have been bad. Sometimes it, sometimes it does actually look like kids are clones of their parents, but that process is called crossing over. And again, that happens in prophase one, whenever these chromatid pairs form this tetrad and then they swap genetic information. Okay, then the rest pretty much is very similar. Metaphase one, these chromatid pairs are going to align on the equator. In anaphase one, the chromatid pairs are pulled to opposite poles. Now in, mito in mitosis, remember, we actually pull pulled those chromatids apart. Here we don't, we pull the pairs apart to opposite poles. And then in telophase one, the nuclear membrane reforms, the spindle goes away, the cytoplasm divides, and now we have two cells. Now those cells are not gonna be genetically the same because of crossing over that happened in prophase one. There's a real brief interphase and then we go into our second divisional sequence. Prophase two, same thing happens. Nuclear membrane disintegrates, mitotic spindle forms, attaches to the centromere. And in metaphase two, these chromatid pairs are now pulled apart. They're pulled apart to opposite I'm sorry, metaphase two, the chromatid pairs line up on the equator. Anaphase two, they're pulled apart to opposite poles. Telophase two, the nuclear membrane reforms, the spindle goes away, the cytoplasm divides, and now we have four cells that are genetically completely different. And each one contains how many chromosomes? 40, 23. 23. They contain 20, no. 146. Yeah. What'd you say? Yes, and, and that's true. And, and, and sometimes, so what can happen sometimes, like, you know, a lot of times people just, you know, in the sperm cell and egg cell, they just have one of each chromosome so that when they come together, you have the, the 23 pairs, right? But sometimes you can have a trisomy or a monosomy, right? And actually a lot of trisomies end in um, a fetus being uh, naturally aborted because they're not gonna be, they're not functional. But some trisomies do result in a birth like trisomy 21. So what happens? Well, in, for example, anaphase two, instead of the chromatid pairs being pulled apart, perhaps uh, they stay together. So maybe now this, this half is gonna have two of that 21st chromosome. And so if this cell, for example, had two of the 21st chromosome and it combines with the egg cell that has one, you have three uh, chromosome 21s in that, um, in that child. So that's how that would, would happen. It's just, you so know. From the end of things, it just went Right, so in anaphase two, instead of them being pulled apart, instead they stay together and two of them go to one side. And they just go to connected? 
Yeah, so like this one would have two of that chromosome, right? That would have two. This one wouldn't have any. So that's how like a monosomy would happen. But again, a lot of times those aren't going to be uh, functional. Good. Any questions? So again, you see, I kind of went through the main events in each thing pretty quickly because it's the same as what happened in mitosis. It's just repeat, repeat the same thing. Okay, so lastly, summary. Meiosis produces four genetically dissimilar gametes or sex cells. DNA is replicated once, but two divisions occur. After the first division, you have two daughter cells that contain, they call them 23 homologous pairs because, okay, they're homologous pairs because they have genetic information in the same place, but the information is different now because of crossing over. And then after the second division, you have four daughter cells that have 23 single chromosomes uh, under normal circumstances. So that's it. So we're skipping epigenetic inheritance. And uh, if there are no questions, you guys can take a break for 10 minutes. Um, are there any questions on this one? All right, take a break. Come back at uh, 11 o'clock and 